there is a time when I'll begin prayer. And that prayer is also part, in a sense, of the diagnostic to determine if there is something demonic that might be attached. Now, very, very often, in every one of these situations, every one of the people who come to me have a different story. And every person's story, in a sense, there's really no cookbook or recipe as to, per se, how to deal with each individual person. But you have to listen for the, you have to listen to the experiences, you have to listen for doorways, and then you try and you employ, really, the, the, um, the battle armor of the church and the tools that we have at our disposal. And so very often when I pray, we'll pray deliverance prayer, it is as well meant to also be, in a sense, a diagnostic to see if there is any entity attached. We very much underestimate the power of our sacraments and our sacramentals. Sacramentals would be things such as a crucifix or holy water, a blessed sacred object, that would be considered a sacramental. A sacrament, and obviously there are seven, I'm kind of speaking here those for those of you who might not be Catholic, there are seven special moments of grace, some of which we experience on a regular basis, such as the Eucharist or maybe confession, but some of the other sacraments which we celebrate once, where they, those are celebrations of that deepen our relationship with Christ, whereas sacramentals are symbols that point out the presence of the divine in our lives. And so very often, those sacramentals can be trigger points, or even the sacraments can be trigger points whereby it will cause, if there is a demonic attachment, it will cause the demon to be threatened and the demon, therefore, to act out. Now, sometimes when I've prayed prayers of deliverance and I've listened to doorways and there does appear to sound like there have been some openings, the demons will also hide. And so, just because of that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't something demonic there. I'm not trying to create something that appears to be demonic. On the other hand, I'm always trying to have an open mind in terms of not only listening for the doorways, but also doing a lot of observation. And I never do any of this stuff alone. I always have members of my prayer team with me. Because it takes, obviously, more than one set of eyes, first of all. But then you also want to provide a sense of safety and security. Because if there is something demonic going on, very often that demon's reaction can cause harm either to me, to members of the prayer team, or to the person themselves. But I want to stress once again, that this ministry is all about healing. Because Christ really had two main roles in his, so, so to speak, job description. He taught and he healed. And certainly in all four Gospels, but probably more in the Gospels of Matthew and in Mark, there are many accounts where Jesus' healings involved exorcisms. When I was in the seminary, this was a topic, and largely today, with some exception, this is a topic that the seminaries in the United States, I don't believe, address at all adequately. And there's very, very few priests, including myself, until I became the exorcist six years ago, there's very few priests who really know much about this ministry or are very well equipped. And some of the exorcists in the country now have really been trying to work, and bishops have been trying to work more with their priests, because there have been more and more people coming in the last few years, coming in and, and, and approaching priests with either the request for deliverance and or exorcism, or coming saying there is something that's outside the realm of what I consider to be normal, and in the realm of the other spiritual that I find myself being affected by. The reason I believe for that is that Benedict XVI, several years into his papacy, made the following statement, although it's a paraphrase. As faith diminishes, superstition increases. And so in that same way, as more and more of the citizenry in our country are not finding meaning or being drawn to, or continue to be adherers to the faith life of whatever tradition they may be coming from, and have found themselves oftentimes, in a sense, isolated. 
We are all spiritual beings on a journey because we all have a soul. And because we have a soul, therefore, each of us is a person. And because of that, there is still a kind of spiritual hunger for why am I here? What am I doing here? And what happens to me when I die? And it doesn't matter what religious background or culture or history, whatever, ever since humanity has had the ability to reason. Because we are persons who have a sense in our human DNA of origin, those questions, in a sense, transcend time. What is the purpose of my life? And how is it I got here beyond the physiological? And where is all of my life going? Is it going to a reality that Christ came to tell us about and help us to become sharers in? Or is it simply a stream of consciousness that involves relationships, ideas, and events that comes to a crashing halt upon the moment that we die? In a sense, our faith leads us at a certain point to a place where we face that bifurcation. We have to decide, is my life on a path that leads back full circle to God Almighty? Or is my life simply on a path 